folks in the booth, I was able to watch the service live streaming from my office. So I was right here with you all. It was a great uh, informational, exhortational information you shared with us, and we appreciate that. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. I wish I could explain to you why I find myself with an affliction that's not altogether different from what we faced at the first of the year, but I told Karen this morning, I said, I, <laughs> I really feel like uh, I did when you uh, made me get out of bed back in September and said, we're going on vacation. Here's your bucket. So uh, the Lord knows. My prayer is that he will help me uh, for these few moments here to take a look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 25 to 35 where he continues to address this matter of, of, of marriage, of singleness or celibacy uh, and he's, he's discussing it not in the light of how he feels about marriage with some chip on his shoulder, how he feels about women. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is he has this overarching concern that nothing impede the advance of the gospel. And I hope you'll see that in these verses this morning. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 25 to 35. I hope you found that in your Bibles. And if you have, stand with me. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen so that you can see it and hear it, reflect upon it. My prayer is the Lord will make it meaningful to us and we'll understand what Paul is saying and not, not misunderstand what he's not saying, as many have. Beginning in verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you've not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Those who mourn as though they were not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This is what it is, the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And let us learn from this today, the challenge that he gives at the end. That wherever we are in life, that we commit and recommit and, and do all necessary within reasonable means to have an undivided devotion to the Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. As I said at the outset, the Apostle Paul has really been unfairly treated. I've read things through the years. Uh, Paul was, a, was supposedly a misogynist. He, he didn't like women. He was, uh, 
He was really down on the institution of marriage and some, some, perhaps some bitter experience he'd had in his own past and on and on and on over passages like this. And that's not at all the case. In fact, I would submit to you that, that no one other than the Lord Jesus Christ lifts a woman to a level of dignity uh, not known of or heard of in the day in which they live. When Paul says in Ephesians 5, that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That was radical. That was radical. There was nothing like that being taught uh, in, the, uh, in, that, in the world of that day. And other things that he says like that, where he lifts the stature of a woman. And so that's not what's going on. What he is addressing here is the reality of persecution. Now, when you put 1 Corinthians on the timeline... The chronology of what's happening in the New Testament, the chronology of Paul's writings. You know that there are the stirrings of persecution, but that the Roman persecution would come uh, with a vengeance about 10 years after this letter was written. So 10 years later, the Romans would really turn their, their fury and their ferocity upon the followers of Jesus Christ. But until that time, it was the Jews who were calling them out as blasphemers, who were causing them to, to have a family strife. There were funerals that were, I put quotes around funerals that were had where, where a son in a family would turn away from Judaism and turn to embrace Christianity and they would have a funeral. They would, as if he was dead, they would have a burial in, in effigy to say our son's no longer alive because he's gone that way. So they, they still had the difficulties. They had the, they had the challenges in a place like Corinth, where by virtue of coming to faith in Christ, they were necessarily rejecting all the, that pantheon of gods that was embraced in these pagan cultures. And by rejecting that, they were looked upon as people who were rejecting the culture. Uh, you may recall that when, when Roman... Uh, persecution got into its full orb that the Christian, the crime they were accused of was atheism. A theos. Theos being God. Ah, no. That these folks did not believe in all the gods the Romans uh, set forth, and so they were atheists, according to the Romans. Well, the Jews saw them as blasphemers. And so he is, he is pressing upon them the reality that persecution coming is complicated by the familial relationships you have, chiefly here in this passage, that of marriage versus celibacy or, or singleness. And you're going to see how he's addressing this here. Not at all uh, putting down marriage. In fact, he says in the course of this text, things you, you don't, don't do to respond to his challenge but rather recognizing the reality of how persecution in a married couple and a family uh, is much more intense. So I want you to see the passage under, under four heads here. First, Paul's divinely inspired counsel concerning marriage and celibacy, verses 25 to 26. Second, Paul's admonition to remain in your current relational status, verses 27 to 28. Third, Paul's exhortation not to let any relationship deter devotion to Christ, verses 29 to 31. And then fourth, Paul's desire that the believers live lives with minimal anxiety. Let's, let's see how this works itself out in this passage. His divinely inspired counsel concerning marriage and celibacy. The reason I use that language is people sometimes misunderstand when he says now concerning the betrothed, and the betrothed is someone who, who has not ever known a man. She has entered into a marriage contract until the time comes that the actual marriage ceremony takes place. Concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord. People read that and say, well, he has no command from Christ. So this is just a kind of a sanctified suggestion from the Apostle Paul. Take it or leave it. No, that's not how he's right. He's simply saying, I cannot quote Jesus Christ on this. But Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So what he is giving 
is divinely inspired. It's a divinely inspired counsel. So he says, concerning this matter, concerning a young woman who may have entered into a marital contract but is not yet married, I don't have any command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Some have suggested this idea of present distress was that there was, there was something going on in, in Corinth, a, a specific uh, incident or, or collection of incidents that Paul is addressing that we don't, we don't know what they were. But he says something else in verse 28 that seems to speak to a wider reality. Uh, the present distress. The present pressure. But they were already, I want you to think, use your sanctified imagination here. A woman, I told you when we started this study that if you wanted to insult a woman in Paul's day, you call her a Corinthian woman. It's an insult to her because of the background in, in Corinth. You had, the, you had temple uh, prostitutes, the women were, some of the men were as well. And so imagine a woman who has come out of that culture. She's found the Lord Jesus Christ. He has set her free. She is new in him. And people who have known her, not sympathetic Corinthians, but people who have known her, look at her, harass her, Try to lure her back into that culture. The press is real. Family, perhaps, that have said, we're not, we're not going with you on this. What you've done is wrong. You, you have shamed us. You've brought shame to the family name by following this, this Jewish rabbi. I mean, if... if practically makes you want to, to gasp, to think such language could be used, but I promise you it was used. And so Paul is saying here, in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. So if you're, if you're betrothed, if you're, if you're a young lady uh, and about to enter into a marriage, there are complications that will necessarily come if you're identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. The word distress here, by the way, uh, it speaks of pressure. Jesus said, in this world you will, we read it in the, in the English, in this world you will have trouble. In this world you will be squeezed. It's just the way it is in terra firma. It's one of those ways God reminds us we're not in heaven yet. We're not where we're ultimately bound. We're not where we were ultimately made to live eternally. And so there will be pressure, there will be difficulty, all kinds of things. We've, we've seen it this week in our congregation, real uh, challenges. We've seen it in recent days. We've been reminded in different ways of what, what frail, creatures of dust we are, how fragile life is, how, how temporary things can be. In this world, you're going to have the distress. You're going to have the pressure, the squeezing. And Paul says, in the light of what's going on, I want you to pause and consider what you're, what you're thinking about doing in terms of the next step, particularly for, for a uh, betrothal, remain as you are. One writer said this, persecution is difficult enough for a single person to endure. But problems and pain are multiplied for those who are married, especially if they have children. If you've read anything in Fox's Book of Martyrs, or if, you read, if you're reading today The Voice of the Martyrs, if you read that magazine today, you know uh, the unspeakable atrocities that occur. You know the, the depths of depravity that some systems will go 
to bring down, to break the uh, commitment of a Christ follower. You know that. It goes on now. You know, we, we have our own first world problems, but I promise you that before the sun sets today, some of our brothers and sisters in Somalia will be executed by al-Shabaab for being a follower of Christ. There are people that will have everything taken. I read the other day that the Chinese government, we just read about China and our, and our climbing the top 50, destroyed one of the largest uh, facilities holding, uh, that held hundreds unto thousands of gatherers who worship, and they just took it down to the ground. So once again, as has happened in China all along, it ebbs and flows. The persecution intensifies, families are disrupted, then it seems to settle down, and families breathe easy and think, well, things are different. No, no, no. So the distress is real. And Paul is thinking in terms of, I want, I want the distress you're going to face. You can't dodge it if you're living in the day he's talking about. But I want it to come to you with as little anxiety as possible. You're going to see this here. Secondly, his admonition to remain in your current relational status. He says, are you bound to a wife? So, so clearly he's not saying when he says to a young betrothed woman, remain as you are. In other words, don't, don't take that foolish step of marriage. That's not what he's saying here. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Don't, don't, don't go divorce a woman in the name of being able to live more effectively and effectually for Jesus Christ. That is not what he's reasoning for here. Bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. What's your relationship? Wherever you are, make the most of your circumstances for the glory of God. We talked about this last week, the, the gospel, the sufficiency of the gospel in your circumstances. Make the most of your circumstances for the glory of God. And so he's not misunderstood in verse 27, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. So don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that, that for the glory of God, the advance of the gospel, marriage is passe. Marriage is a thing of the past. Forget marriage. That falls right into the snare of what was written when he, when he begins to address this topic in 1 Corinthians 7, the early verses, when the Corinthians were saying it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It was a, it was a wrong-headed response to them coming out of a pagan culture. If you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet, and here's the reality. Those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. He's not here talking about the institution of marriage being the, being the context in which worldly troubles come. Although the reality is, put two unique human beings under the same roof, and it's a challenge if you're not going to follow his uh, exhortation toward the end of this passage. It does intensify. Uh, it sanctifies you if, you if you will respond appropriately. Otherwise, it becomes an occasion for you to really hurt somebody deeply. So he says here, you're going to have worldly troubles. And I want to spare you, not spare you, the, the hassle of being married to a spouse, I want to spare you the troubles that intensify. Let me just give you one example. A husband and a wife in Christ face challenges. Authorities come to break the husband. He's committed to Jesus. He's not going to easily break. So they turn their attention to the wife to break the husband. Or if there are children, they turn their attention to the children to break the husband. Story after story after story of this. They abound and they're painful to read, incredibly painful to experience. And so he says, I would spare you that intensity of trouble the third thing he says is, is it's exhortation not to let any relationship deter devotion to Christ. This is probably the most misunderstood portion of this passage. Once people are willing to grant that he's not down on marriage, listen to what he says here. 
In verse 29, this is what I mean. Brothers, the appointed time has grown very short. Now, people could argue and say, well, Paul was way off the beam there. This was back in the first century. No, for, for where Paul lived, and, and we need to learn something from this. The time is always at hand. Part of the problem of Western Christianity is that we, we live as if Jesus is not returning soon. Paul says the time is short. We've been, we've been living in the last days, you know this, since Pentecost. That's what Peter said when they said, these folks are, are too, it's, it's too early for people to be drunk. What's wrong with these people? No, these people are not drunk as you suppose. This is that prophesied by Joel in the last days, these things will happen. And so Peter has marked out in God's providence that the last days are unfolding. For Paul, it seemed very imminent, but put yourself where he was. Here's a man who was hunted by his countrymen. He was, he was falsely accused by Judaizers who went around uh, thinking, I think they thought they were Christians. They were not. They were confused about that. Uh, he, is, he, he faces affliction. He was stoned to death and resuscitated, shipwrecked, beaten, snake bitten. I mean, this is the life of the Apostle Paul. And so for him, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, not, not at all meaning to ignore the wife. He's just spoken to that in the early verses of chapter 7. Where he's told that we don't, don't separate. Your, your body doesn't belong to you, husband. It belongs to your wife. Your body doesn't belong to you, wife. It belongs to your husband. Only, only come apart and in the intimate marital union on an agreed-upon time that you may devote yourself to to. Uh, intensifying the things of the Lord. He's here saying, don't let being married distract you from service to Christ. And by the way, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen sincere people who come together in marriage and their, their devotion to Christ begins to be put on the back burner. And children come along and and in the name of loving their children, uh, they put Jesus on the back burner. And Paul's aware of this temptation. And so he says, live as though you, you had none. Don't ignore your wife. Don't mistreat your wife. Don't, don't fail to care for your wife. But live with Jesus as the first devotion. Those who mourn, as though they were not mourning. Of course, grief, he's not saying, you know, suck it up. Stiff upper lip, Jesus is risen, he's coming. He's not saying that. He's simply saying that for some people, and you know them, you know some people who, who've gone through a crisis in their life, a, a, a loss of a loved one, and it may have been some time ago, and to this day they live in a sadness, in a depression, and yet they would claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes says there is a time to mourn. But you don't make that where you live when you experience great loss. So his way of, of describing this here, as if you were not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. So, it's, so he doesn't have it in for people who know how to feel pain. He's talking about any experience in life when you have occasion to rejoice that you don't make that the focus. Our rejoicing is in the Lord. Our rejoicing is in seeing the gospel advance. And so he says, if you have a reason or occasion to rejoice, don't make that the be all end all. And again, you've seen it. You've seen people who profess to be Christians and if, they're not, if there's not something going on that, that makes them happy, then they're miserable. And a miserable Christian is a contradiction of terms. Now, what all he is saying through here in these, these descriptions he's using is don't let anything supersede your love and devotion for Jesus Christ. Now, if we back, th back through this, the reason is because if your first love, and this was the accusation that the, the risen, ascended Christ gives to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation, if your first love is Jesus Christ, then you will relate to your spouse in a very redemptive way sanctifying, gospel-advancing way. 
Your home exists under God to model to your community the love that Christ has for his church and the devotion the church has to Christ. That is, that is otherwise, brothers and sisters, otherwise, we could be like rabbits. But it's in that precious marital union that we model, we should model, to a watching community what real joy looks like, joy in the Lord that filters through our relationship. So marriage will be uh, all that it should be. Those who mourn, we, we will grieve with hope when the gospel is the pulse. We rejoice in context, giving thanks to God always for all things. If we're not letting other things take the place of Jesus Christ. Those who buy as if they had no goods, you don't make the purchase of things. The key to happiness. And then those who deal with the world as if the world, they had no dealings with it for. And here's, here's why. The present form of the world is passing away. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're to engage the world with the gospel. John said in 1 John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is from the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of the world are passing away with it. But he who is practicing the will of God is abiding forever. John was saying the same thing here. Time is short. That's the point he's making. Romans 13, 11, 12. Let me just read these real quickly. Beside this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And if we say, well, Paul was saying this some 1900 plus years ago and it hadn't happened yet. We are not being wise. We need to say, dear God, teach me to see life to see reality, to see eternity like the Apostle Paul saw it, because he saw it under the divine inspiration of your Holy Spirit. James 4.14, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and vanishes. 1 Peter 1.24, all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower. The grass withers, the flower fades. He's quoting Isaiah. Time is short, and it's shorter now than it was yesterday. God lets us wake up in the morning, it'll be shorter then. Live that way. Finally, Paul's desire that, believer, that the believers live lives with minimal anxiety. This is what it's all about for him. Verse 32 to 35. I want you to be free from anxieties. Now, Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Paul would say, be anxious for nothing. Uh, by prayer and supplication and everything, let your thanks be request be known to God. Here he's saying, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. Here's his primary concern. He makes it plain here. How to please the Lord. The man who is not married is, is, is more singularly focused because a man who is married has the responsibility under God to care for his wife. Because Paul said to Timothy, you don't care for your family. You're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. So, so when you join these marital relationships, fam familial relationships, it challenges you. So he, he just acknowledges the obvious here. The unmarried man, concerned about the things of God. But the married man, verse 33, is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. So, so the temptation to anxiety intensifies. But I want you to notice something here. Paul gives us a key to marriage. The married man is driven to know what pleases his wife. That's Paul's summary of what a relationship of a husband to his wife looks like. And his interests are divided. I mean, he's just, he's challenged. You know that's true. I know that's true. Being, being the husband of, of a wife, a precious wife, I mean, a woman who's put up with me 43 years, father of five children, 11 grandchildren. I mean, it, it just, it gets exponential, you know? Uh, and to not let any of those relationships step in front of my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is a real challenge. I know parents who worship their children. 
God despises that. You shall have no other gods before me, not even the children I've given you as a heritage from me. So he's saying there's a dividedness there. The unmarried or betrothed woman. Here he's speaking to a woman who's the unmarried, uh, probably one who's divorced, perhaps widowed, or betrothed. That's the single woman we talked about earlier. Is anxious about the things of the Lord. How to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things. How to please her husband. He's not using worldly things here as bad things. He's simply the, the, the world, the reality, the day to day. This is clean. Clothes wash and dry. Iron. Meals cook. I mean, it's just reality. You can't, you can't say, well, I, I don't do any of that because I'm so devoted to Jesus Christ. I mean, that's just the reality. That's how you relate to one another. Verse 35, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you. That's going back to, the, I can't find a command from Jesus for this, but I'm telling you, my best judgment is this, because he was living it. Uh, Denny Burke read it, wrote an excellent article, if you can find it, Denny, B-U-R-K, about uh, Paul's background. And he was probably, as a Pharisee, probably married, and he probably his wife probably died. That's a, when he uses some of the focuses on some of the language Paul uses when he implies those things. For your benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure, here it is, your undivided devotion to the Lord. Do you have that? Do I have that? Have I made the mistake of imagining that if I will just focus on taking care of my wife, that God, that'll be enough for God? No, because God says, I gave you your wife as a helper suitable to your needs. Have I made the mistake of thinking, if I just focus on my children? God says, no. You, you live and move and have your being by me. My son is to be your delight. We sang earlier, you're enough for me. You're enough for me. And so uh, we have a real challenge here. And I promise you the days are getting worse. The days are getting darker. The things we read about in other countries are coming to our shores. They're coming. And if we're not continually before the Lord praying, dear God, help me to be laser focused on your glory on the exalting of the name of your son, my Savior, of advancing the gospel to see that, that there's one chief reason you gave me these children and let me live as the blessing of the Scripture says, they shall see their children's children. Let me live to see my, my children's children, my grandchildren, is to see them one to Christ. If I put that on the back burner, if I say to my children in word and in action, look, these things are important, and they'll have their place in time. But this, this stuff over here is much more important. Then we're, we're, we're ignoring Paul's concern. And we're going to unwittingly intensify the anxiety. And we're necessarily going to be tugged at with divided devotion. And Paul is challenging here to have undivided devotion to Jesus Christ. So that flowing out of that undivided devotion will help me to be the kind of spouse he'd call me to be be the kind of neighbor he would call me to be, to be the kind of father he would call me to be, the kind of grandfather in my relationships if my devotion to Christ is undivided. But if it is divided, if I think somehow I can give him a little and spread it around, then I am not doing well, I'm not wise, and there will be necessarily anxiety that will come from that, much of which will be self-inflicted. Will we hear the Apostle Paul today? But we have a single eye to Jesus. Well, but pastor, I'm concerned about, I understand. We could all pool our concerns here today and probably plunge one another into depression. <laughs> but is your eye focused on him who loved you with an everlasting love, who gave his darling son, did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Is your eye there? Is your heart there? 
Is your mind, are your thoughts there? Is your life there? Not so that you can justify neglecting other relationships, but so that you can, by the grace and power of God, make those other relationships so meaningful, getting ready for the press. It's coming. It's coming. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for this word. And we confess, Lord, we read over it and say, goodness gracious, how am I going to do that? And yet I know that, that everything you have taught us in your word, everything your spirit inspired the apostle to write, that in your grace and for your glory, your spirit will enable us to undertake it, that you haven't called us to do anything that your grace will not grant the wherewithal to accomplish. So we pray, dear God, help us in distracting times. It's not just the pressure of distracting times. It's the trinkets of them. It's the shiny things. Help us, help us to not be distracted, to, to be singularly focused on you, your glory, our devotion to Christ, undivided devotion. And then out of that, help us to be more meaningful in the relationships you've placed us and to be better prepared for the days that are coming. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.